Hi everyone, welcome to Zero Carbon Conference 2023. Um, thank you for being here today from all over the world. I'm Tomoko Fujiwara from Japan. Um, I'm working at Environmental Policy Div Division, Nakano Prefecture Government Office. I am the MC for today. Um, we have uh, simultaneous interpretation. In so in your webinar control, click interpretation, then click the language you that you would like to hear. So first, uh, let me explain the background of this conference. Nagano Prefectural Government, uh, Kaledia University of Applied Science, the University of Eastern Finland, and Eno School Net Association organized this zero carbon conference based on memorandum of understanding with cooperation in the field of regional development, education, and research in forestry, renewable energy between Nagano Prefecture and um, Regional Council of North Kaledia of Finland. Uh, we have two days and each day has a theme. The one today focuses on mitigation, which is achieved either by reducing the sources of greenhouse gases or by enhancing the storage of these gases. We especially talk about how to utilize local resources and make our lifestyle sustainable. Day two focuses on adaptation, which is possible by taking action to prevent or minimize the damage effects of climate change can cause or taking advantage of opportunities that may arise. So we talk about the we talk about in terms of sustainable local businesses. Each day, there are uh, keynote speech presentations from companies, organizations, and students. At the end of each day, we will summarize the presentations. The discussion will be in an online platform during the, sorry, during the conference days. I will explain about it later. Before we start sessions, we have some opening speeches. First, we have opening remarks from Ambassador Tanya Yaskarainen, Embassy of Finland in Tokyo. The students and participants of the Zero Carbon Conference, it is my great pleasure to open and address this two-day Zero Carbon Conference, which is now arranged for the second time. My name is Tanya Eskelainen. I'm the ambassador of Finland to Japan. Climate change and questions related to environment are, in my opinion, among the most important areas for international cooperation. These questions concern all of us, no matter where we live. It is important to actively look for new ways to work together to solve the pressing global issue of climate change. This conference is an excellent example of much needed collaboration. And I'm really pleased that Finland and Japanese stake, Finnish and Japanese stakeholders are gathered around this topic. This year, the conference has two themes, mitigation and adaptation, two ways to tackle the changes in climate environment. Both perspectives are really critical. It is of utmost importance to seek carbon neutral solutions to mitigate the harmful effects on climate. We also need to adapt and come up with clever new ways to ensure a more sustainable future. Climate change needs to be addressed on all levels of society, governments, industries, education, research and science, as well as among civil society and individuals. Everyone's input is needed. Questions to be addressed are diverse from finding more innovative and sustainable ways to produce items, farming for food, but also related to consuming, traveling and living our everyday lives. In this conference, you will talk about many different ways to mitigate climate change and adapt to it. Zero carbon solutions are needed everywhere 
and there are many interesting in initiatives and technological innovations already. Finland, for example, is one of the leaders globally in creating bio-based alternative solutions to tackle overuse of plastic and production of textile waste. Many other innovations are being developed around the world. What makes me particularly happy is to see you students talk about these topics in this conference and participate as audience. Young people are the ones whose lives are likely to be affected by the very concrete effects of climate change. Your thoughts, clever ideas and innovations are a very central part of the solution. You are the agents and advocates of change. The current decision makers and leaders around the world have the responsibility to act in a way that ensures a livable planet for the future generations, and they should listen to your messages. Dear students, I hope this conference gives you inspiration to participate in global discussions and voice your thoughts. They matter, and you all have an important role to play. Finally, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to be part of this, to all this. I hope you best of success in your valuable work and hope you enjoy the interesting program of Zero Carbon Conference 2023. Thank you. Kitos and arigato gozaimashita. Ambassador, thank you so much for your warm message. I hope this conference is an opportunity to build a great relationship between Finland and Japan. Now uh, we have another opening remarks from Mr. Takashi Maseki, Director of Environmental uh, Department at Nagano Prefecture Government on behalf of organizers. Okay. Could you turn on your camera yes. and mic please? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Takashi Maseki, and the Associate Director General of the Environment Department from Nano Prefecture Government. I will make some brief remarks on behalf of the organizers. Uh, first off, I appreciate all the efforts of North Carolina and the conference staff in holding the Dell Carbon Conference. It is thanks to them that participants can attend from all around the globe. Nagano Prefecture was the host of the 1998 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games and is known for this legacy. Nagano is a major forest prefecture in Japan and is covered by 80% of forest land. We cherish the blessings of nature in our, uh, in our everyday lives. However, in October 2019, Super Typhoon Hajibis tore through Nagano, causing huge damage. In December of that year, we became the first prefecture in Japan to declare a climate emergency. At that time, we also announced our res resolution to go zero carbon by 2050. The issue of climate change stretches across regions and generations. It is the responsibility of our generation and the countries that have contributed significantly to greenhouse gases to take immediate action to stop the climate crisis for the future generation. Nagano Prefecture launched the Sustainable Nagano Cross Creation Platforms in September 2022. This is a place to learn, connect, and co create beyond fields, generations, and regions. We have started our new efforts to mobilize wisdom from around the world and confront climate change. Now the prefecture focuses on the development of the next generation. Last December, we conducted a program to send high school students to environmentally advanced countries the Netherlands and Switzerland. With the knowledge that they acquired, 
the students are about to act toward climate change in their communities and schools. The Zero Carbon Conference is an opportunity for sharing issues and activities beyond countries, regions, and generations. This is utterly one of the ideal platforms Nagano Prefecture hopes to create. Mutual understanding and connections will create a bigger impact than you can accomplish on your own. Both presenters and participants are part of the team to fight against this global issue. Let's work together towards what we can do in our communities first and change the world so that we can create a brighter future for the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Um, there is another special surprise message from Japanese actor Ken Watanabe. Uh, he cu currently lives in Karuizawa, Nagano, and he is interested in sustainability. So he, he sent us a message for this conference. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Watanabe. Unless we act now to prevent global warming for our generation and for your children's generation, it will be too late. Think about what we can do and what society can do and take the lead in bringing the issue to people's attention. I hope that this conference will lead to great change. Let's keep moving forward. Thank you so much for cheering up. Okay, so now I would like to explain the tool we are going to use today. Let me show you uh, my screen. Okay, so during the presentation, all participants can post your questions and comments through this tablet, which is an online board we can use simultaneously from around the world. You will receiving this link in the Zoom chat box and on YouTube. You will have different public for each day and the links will be announced at the beginning of each day and also during the session. So let me show you how we are going to use this public. So you can, as you can see, each speaker has their own section here. And so if you have any questions or comments, you can write down here. But before you do that, we would like you to log in from the top right corner. You can log in either with Google, Microsoft, or Apple account. So you can also post comments without login if you want to be uh, anonymous. Once you are here, questions and comments are for, for any speakers. You can just add um, comments here and press enter. It will show there. So you can edit and delete your comments, but you cannot edit and delete other people's comments. I would like to remind you basic ways of how to interact on the internet. So be polite, be constructive, don't be insulting. You can use this also after the session and it's open all through the day. So speakers will come back at some point and reply directly in this public. Okay, so let's get started. Um, today's keynote speaker is Ms. Tomoko Kusamoto, Director of Hakuba International School Foundation. Hello. Hi. Hi, Tomoko. <laughs> Hello, Tomoko. Okay. Hi, <laughs> the same name. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this conference. We're honored to have you here today. 
I'm very honored to be here. I'm a bit thank nervous, you. but uh, very excited. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And before her speech, um, let me introduce her profile. So after graduating from University of Tokyo with a BA in economics, she started her career at U.S. investment banks. She gained her MBA from UC Berkeley and worked, at, worked for Goldman Sachs in the private equity division. She left the finance industry when she had, a first, she had her first child and is now a mother of three. Inspired by natural beauty, um, she and her husband moved to Hakuba in 2009 to raise their family. Through her, her experience in revitalizing a local public school, Hakuba High School, she saw a great opportunity in offering world-class education in Hakuba and opened Hakuba International School in 2022. She is a co-founder of Hakuba SDG Lab too. So I'm thrilled to hear your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, I'm really honored to be here and I'm super excited um, because I know that there are so many students uh, from different parts of the world participating. And I think uh, I really see that uh, you are the one who can make a change. And um, I will do my best uh, to recoup my mistakes, but uh, I, I really am thrilled to, to work with all the younger generations in the world. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, today, I am hoping to share some of my story um, that why I decided to do what I do, and I hope it might give you some uh, inspirations uh, to the, the participants today. So let me share my screen. Let's see. Can you see the screen? And one second. Oops, sorry. Let me just go to the slideshow. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, let me just um, introduce my little village called Hakuba. Um, so we are at the north end of Nagano Prefecture, and Nagano Prefecture is pretty much in the right, uh, in the center of Japan, and we have a population of about 9,000 people in Hakuba village. Uh, our main industries are agriculture and tourism, and it takes about two and a half to three and a half hours from Tokyo, depending on what kind of transport you use. And we are known for beautiful, distinct four seasons. Uh, and we were also known for uh, what we call Japao, Japanese powder snow. Uh, and we are very proud of that. Uh, just a little bit about myself, but I think uh, the other Tomoko-san did a great job introducing my uh, background. So just briefly, uh, I um, worked in finance before I came to Hakuba, but we moved to Hakuba in 2009 to raise our family because I really wanted our children to grow up in the nature. And we have been so happy um, being here and I have nothing but gratitude to Hakuba for being such a wonderful hometown for our three children. And since we started living in Hakuba, I started to notice things that I didn't notice when I was in the big cities like Tokyo or New York or Hong Kong. Um, because we are so close to nature, I started to realize when I first moved here in 2009, cherry blossom season was more like in, in uh, May. Um, and then now I noticed that most of the cherry blossoms like uh, seasons is over uh, before the end of April. 
And also in summer, um, it used to be nice and cool in Hakuba, so we didn't really need air conditioner. I remember debating with my husband when we were building a house in 2010 whether or not uh, we should install the air conditioner or not. But um, I'm really glad that we did because now there are a few weeks of the year where like, it would be very hard to stay in the house if we didn't put on the air conditioner. And things like, this is um, a photo of my backyard and you see the Japanese monkey. Um, they were never around here before. Uh, they were seen in maybe in the southern end of the Hakuba Valley, but not around here, but I see them all the time now. All those little changes started to make me realize that the climate change is real and it's actually a real threat to humanity. This is another photo from February 20, I think it was 2020. And uh, February is supposed to be the time where like we should have the, the largest amount of snow. But as you can see at the, the in the valley, it's brown and there's no snow. And that was really shocking to me that this was happening. I really love those beautiful four seasons of Hakuba. And just like every other resident in Hakuba, I really like uh, our children and our grandchildren and the, the, all the future generations to be able to enjoy the nature just like we did. So I started thinking about what I could possibly do to, to help stop this climate change. And I got together with uh, um, a person called Kota Watanabe and he works for Hakuba Village Office. And we talked about maybe creating some community group where we can discuss about the climate change and or more broadly about sustainability and try and make Hakuba Village more sustainable place. And uh, so we formed the group called Hakuba SDGs Lab. Uh, and uh, our first kickoff meeting uh, was held in June, 2019. And there are about 60 people um, who came and among those 60 people, oh, and we had uh, our speaker, Ian Shimizu, who is uh, an amazing environmental activist. And he uh, talked about the, the importance of SDGs and the current state of climate change. And among those 60 people who came, we had those three high school students. And I know they presented at the last year's conference, um, this their carbon conference, and I was really, really proud. Uh, and they came and... When they first came to our meeting, they had not much of an idea about climate change or, you know, what SDGs were all about. But they are um, they got very interested and started researching and started to take actions. The first action they took was back in September 2019. Uh, uh, that's when Greta Thunberg was asking all the youth around the world to do the climate march or climate strike. And so they tried to do it in Hakuba and they did. As you can see, we got together in front of the Hakuba station and we marched around the town and then we went to the village office and they submitted the uh, petition to the mayor asking him to declare a climate emergency. And at the time there was no other municipalities in Japan that declared climate emergency. And at the end of this march, we had about 200 people together. And um, for a village of 9,000 people, 200 are a lot of people. And then they studied more. And those three students came up and learned about the climate refugees, that there are some people like in a tropical island who didn't really emit that much of a CO2. Uh, but because of the CO2 that we emit that um, in order to maintain our lifestyle, uh, they've been sort of um, kicked out of their own homeland and they had to find somewhere else to live because the, the sea level is rising and their uh, island was disappearing. And they were um, uh, very, very uh, worried about that. And they wanted other people to know more about those climate refugees issue. So they hosted a charity bazaar to raise money for the climate refugees. And, um, and in that way, they thought that they could bring in um, people from uh, in their generation as well. And they did. And they raised about $2,000. And uh, we um, took it to the United Nations so that they can donate it to the, the climate refugees. And at the same time, they um, 
uh, submit the petition again to um, declare a climate emergency to the mayor of Hakuba Village. At the time, it was Mr. Shimokawa. And the village did declare a climate emergency in December uh, 2019. And then they moved on uh, in February 2020 to do the climate march on the snow uh, because they love skiing and snowboarding. And then they were very concerned that we are not getting enough snow and we may not be able to ski in the future years anymore. So uh, they held this amazing climate march and uh, uh, at the Iwatake Ski Resort. And Iwatake Ski Resort CEO decided to run the lifts just on the renewable energy on those weekends that they were doing the march. And and then back to the same photo that I showed you earlier. And this was the year that we had the record low snowfall. And that was right, just the right timing for them to do the march. And I think it really touched a lot of people's heart. And then they learned um, that uh, in a place like Nagano Prefecture, um, insulation is the, the major a key to mitigate climate change because it gets really cold in Nagano in general. And uh, if you insulate the buildings properly, you can really reduce the amount of energy that you use. So that was probably one of the most important things uh, you could do to, to make a change. And unfortunately, many of the buildings or houses uh, in Japan in general, I guess, are not well insulated. So they set out to do the insulation project themselves for their classroom, and they did, and it made a major difference. And their energy cost has um, gone down quite significantly. And given that evidence, um, I believe uh, Nagano Prefecture uh, decided to um, make a policy, and now I believe they have the subsidy for the schools to, to do the insulation project. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I know that there's one primary school in Hakuba which did the insulation project last year, and also I think there are six other high schools or five other high schools um, which are doing this uh, insulation of their own classrooms. And I think it was it is an amazing thing that those uh, students' uh, initiatives would uh, make an impact in the policy of the Nagano Prefecture. And to um, I, I know that uh, Mr. Maseki earlier had said that Nagano Prefecture is very serious about tackling this issue. And I'm so glad to see that they are showing that um, as, you know, uh, on their part as well, taking an action. So those three students um, did so much in my mind for Hakuba uh, because they raised their voice and take an action. I think they um, really mobilized so many people in the community and the companies and the organizations. And um, it's, uh, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but I just wanted to list all those different events that um, were kind of uh, initiatives for mitigating the uh, climate change and reducing CO2. And those ones in green are the uh, high school students' actions. And thanks to, um, not just thanks to their action, of course, but uh, um, but also I, I really do believe that they made a big difference, that um, uh, the, a lot of the uh, different communities have been formed um, and uh, lots of the, the actions have been taken in this area. And I would like to talk a little bit more in details about those are four things that I'm um, more personally involved. One of them is uh, Pro Protect Our Winter Japan, uh, called POW Japan uh, for short. And they are the, the group of professional skiers and snowboarders who are very keen to protect their winters and snow. And that's a large organization in the United States and their chapter in Japan is based in this area. And they have been doing so much in terms of educating the ski resorts to help them uh, reduce their CO2 emissions, uh, doing hosting lots of workshops. And I think they're making a big change here. And another one is the Hakuba Valley Tourism, which is a tourism uh, promotion um, organization has formed the SDGs committee, which I am a chair person. And uh, we have been working really hard to uh, try and share the um, uh, significance of climate change and help the people in tourism industry take some action. And I will show you some more examples on that. Um, and I'm very proud to say one of the, the prominent ski resort 
Uh, many of you might remember or know Hakuba through 1998 Nagano Olympics and Hapo One Ski Resort was one of the venue for the downhill racing. Uh, and their lifts are solely 100% operated by the renewable energy. And that started by those two ladies who cared so much about the environment. And they formed the SDGs um, marketing group within their company and they're promoting uh, different initiatives to mitigate the climate change. And also uh, there's this group called Zero Carbon Study Group has been formed and they have been doing so many different workshops so that people can share their practices. Sometimes we talk about the compost, sometimes we talk about the solar panels in the snowy uh, climate. And it's such a lot of wisdom in the community that we can share when we form a community group like this. And it has been making a lot of impact uh, I feel. And then my own uh, initiative was to build a school. Uh, my conclusion in all this was that education was probably the most important thing that we can do for the future generations. So um, we established the Hakuba International School. It's an international boarding school. Uh, it caters to seventh to twelfth grades. And at the moment, we just opened last September. And currently, we have seventh and eighth graders. And our key question, the driving question as a school is what kind of education enables people and planet to flourish? And we are here to answer the question with the students. And we have this um, um, nine acres of forest as a school site. We don't really have a proper school building yet, but we have two ski lodges that we use for one for boarding house and one for um, classrooms. And um, uh, when the students are, are designing their own learning space, and we are hoping to build a zero carbon school building in this forest uh, in the next two or three years. And we do a lot of project-based learning where the students will go out in the community and do some projects related to sustainability and learn how we can mitigate the climate change and you know, many other sustainability related issues. Uh, we do a lot of social emotional learning because unless you can take care of your own well-being, it's impossible to look after the planet's well-being. So we do a lot of this kind of advisory uh, sessions. And we focus a lot on outdoor education because we believe that unless you have a personal connection with nature, it's very hard to care about nature. And that's the way that you can really open up to new ideas and new lifestyles, you know, when you really care about the nature and when you're serious about conserving it. And I would like to um, share this quote uh, from Einstein. Um, and that says, uh, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but those who do watch them without doing anything. And I really believe that. Um, I was bystander before I moved to Hakuba. I didn't really want to think too much about climate change or global warming because I didn't really want to worry about using too much plastic and I didn't really want to change my lifestyle. But now that I live in Hakuba and I, I really see the impact of climate change with my own eyes, I feel it every day. Uh, I really feel like um, you know, whatever small step I can take, I really should be taking uh, for my children and then their children and for all the future generations. And um, everyone gathered here today, I'm sure, would share that concern. And um, if it's if I still have time, uh, if it's OK, maybe uh, I would share the video that uh, Akba Valley Tourism created to promote sustainability, just so you can see um, some beautiful site of our village. Um, tomoko -san, is it okay if I, do, do I have time or should I? Sorry, you had muted. Hi, uh, yeah, it's okay. You can okay. play the video, yes. Perfect. Okay, let me just uh, pop it up if I can. ボクらが大きくなった時
世界的スノーリゾートとして知られる大町白馬小谷の三子村からなる白馬バレーも雄大な北アルプスが織りなす山岳エコツーリズムの聖地として全ての人と環境に寄り添える循環型経済へと大きく舵を切っています自然を生かし自然と共に成長するそんな白馬バレーになっていきます意識を変える必要があるのはわかるけど実際何から始めたらいいのかわかりませんそんな時は資源には確実に限りがあるより環境に負荷の少ない選択をしてみるという意識を持ってみてくださいたったそれだけで大きな変化が生まれます捨てていた生ゴミはコンポーストで資源に変えられます自転車で自然を感じながら通勤している人がいます地産地消で無駄が減って笑顔が増えましたここで使うエネルギーに薪ストーブや薪ボイラーを取り入れた宮沢ベーカリーさん。薪ストーブはまずはやっぱり暖かいですね。暖かさはやっぱり全然多分スキーストーブとか比べても違うと思うんですけど、まあ、なかなか利用されないあの針葉樹なんかも遠くに持っていかれたりとかそういうものも使えば当然安くでも手に入るし、地域にとってもいいかなと思って今いろんなことを今試してやってますけどね。実際に自然の中で働く方は今の環境の変化をどう感じているのでしょうか冬はスキー場のパトロール夏はグリーンパトロールとして活躍する石原さん雪は確実に少しずつは減ってると思いますデータでもそうだし、まあ、自分で感じるのもでもやっぱ若い人たちは環境問題とかにものすごく前向きだなと感じるし一緒に取り組んでいかなきゃいけないかなっていうのも感じますもう誰かが変えてくれっちゃうときっとダメなんでしょうね自分たちがやれることからこの先環境保護の理念はただの凡庸なスローガンではなく安全基準や労働環境と同様に企業が当然考慮すべき事案として扱われるようになるでしょうそしてすでにこの SDGs はやるかやらないかではなくより良い未来のために今日からできることを見つけポジティブに取り組むという段階まで来ていますここは胸を張って世界に誇れる山岳エコツーリズムの聖地白馬バレーこのエリアの当たり前はきっと世界の最先端になれるはずです100年後もこの笑顔を残すために観光に携わる私たちだからこそできることがあるはずですまずは私たちから SDGs アクションを一緒に始めましょう I guess that concludes my presentation, and、um, I hope we can、uh, think and discuss and learn together going forward so that we can build a brighter future. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, thank you so much for your inspiring presentation and a beautiful video.、Thank、That's、you. amazing. The various stakeholders are working on climate change in Hakuba Village. I think we're very lucky that we have so many people who care about this issue. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone wants to visit Hakuba and your school now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, if you have any questions and comments to presenters, you can post on Padlet, as I mentioned, anytime during the conference, and the presenters will answer the questions. So, let's move on to Expert presentations. So, first presenter is speaker is Miss Mariko Harada, non for fit organization Mamete Kinasa from Nagano, Japan. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Mariko. Hi. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just. 
turn the video off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining today. So, uh, Mariko was born in Tokyo, moved to Nagano City in 2017 uh, while enjoying the nature rich con country life in Kinasa, such as picking mountain vegetables and growing vegetables. vegetables. She is also active as a staff member of NPO, a uh, nonprofit organization, Mamete Kinasa, and Kinasa Tourism Association. Her presentation title is Toward a Community That is Self-Efficient in Food and Energy. So Mariko, you can start your presentations when you are ready. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Momoko-san. So let me share my PowerPoint. Can you see the slide? Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. And hi, everyone. My name is Mariko Harada from Mamete Kinasa. And I am honored to be there and to make, to have the opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you. And I hope my presentation will be able to give some ideas to younger generation attending this conference. First of all, and let me introduce myself. Uh, as Tomoko-san introduced, um, I was born and raised in Tokyo and moved to Nagano six years ago. And why I moved to Nagano is because <laughs> Uh, I wanted to live in an environment where fields and community-based forests are close. Uh, I felt in my urban life that it was important to live in a place where the most fundamental and essential things like clean water, air, and soil were close by. I felt that it was important to live within my measures and to produce food to protect myself from climate change, natural disasters, wars, and many other uncertainties. After thinking deeply about the earth and the environment, I came to the very simple idea of living with soil. Then, by chance, I became involved with Kinasa. So, Kinasa is a mountain town located in the north of Nagano Prefecture, just next to Hakuba uh, that Kusamoto Tomoko-san uh, introduced. Okay. Surrounded by mountains and dotted with many houses in the valley, it is known as the city of the body, like this photo. And the name Kinasa means the village without evil spirit. So uh, how Kinasa came to be called to Kinasa, uh, it, is, it takes a long time to display, this, describe. So please refer to this page or uh, scan this QR code, please. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, about the Kinasa, uh, the population was approximately 1,200. And like many other mountain areas in Japan, it is characterized by a high population of elderly people aged 65 and over. And more Kinasa has more than, uh, the area has more than 90% of the area is mountain forest. And life in this area is very rich in nature with wild vegetables in spring and nuts and mushrooms in autumn. On the other hand, forestry and 
hemp cultivation, which were the main industries in the area about 50 years ago, have declined due to the most of foreign, uh, I'm sorry, have declined due to the import of foreign timber and the spread of synthetic fibers. And the community-based forest, which called the Satoyama, have fallen into disrepair due to lack of human intervention. So now let's talk about Mamete Kinasa. Okay. Mamete, it means lively or energetic or vibrant in the local dialect here. And Mamete Kinasa is a nonprofit organization that aims to create self-reliant community through self-sufficiency in food and energy. The farmland and community-based forests are devastated due to the, an, an aging and shrinking population. So in 2010, the NPO, this NPO was set up by local volunteers with the aim of creating a small but sustainable kinasa. And the main themes are energy, food, and lifestyle. So energy self-sufficiency activities include solar power generation and wood fuel, pro wood fuel production. The solar power generation started in 2015. It generates 5,000 kilowatt hours power per year and receives an annual income of 2 million Japanese yen, which is approximately 14,000 euro from the sales of electricity. A special feature in this solar power generation is the angle of panels. To prevent snow and accumulating, accumulating on the panels and interfering with the generation of electricity during the winter, the panels are angled at 45 degrees to keep the snow off. And in summer season, the goats uh, the main uh, prayer to cut the grass. And there, the, there are special, several points in citizen power solar power station. One is that building with our own hands as much as possible. As it, uh, it would have required a lot of money to higher and is in store and it was difficult to raise funds. So the volunteers of Mamete Kinasa did what they could do by themselves, such as setting up the frame and installing the panels. And the community will maintain the panels for 20 years, which is set to said to be the useful life of the panels. Then this allowed us to re reduce the size of the project, scale of the operations and cut the budget significantly. And the last point is that the installation, in, <laughs> installation cost of 13 million yen or about 91,500 euro was financed by 100% citizen investment instead of borrowing from the bank. The citizen investment was funded, funded by the office Okisama Energy Fund in Ida City, Nagano. The photo was taken, this photo was taken at the inauguration ceremony. And you can see everyone had a good smile. Okay. 
And next, another energy initiative is the maintenance and the energy self-sufficiency of community-based forests that are unmaintenance, unmaintained. In 2013, Akinasa Firewood Station was built. Then timber cut from the community-based forest is processed into firewood. At the at Kinasa Firewood Station, we are utilizing firewood to create a framework of regional circulation. We turn and maintain the community-based forest trees and thinned it into firewood to fuel the wood boilers of local hot spring facilities or sell to campsite or wood fired bakery shops and wood stove users. It also creates employment for local people to make firewood. This is the wood, fire, wood fired boiler at the local hot spring facility, Kinasa no Yu Hotel and Cottage. Since 2017, Kinasa Firewood Station provides the firewood here. Approximately 130 cubic meters of firewood is used annually. It means approximately 40,000 liters of kerosene oil have been reduced compared to 70,000 liters used before. And the, the, the camping boom in Japan has also helped us to increase the demand or for firewood at campsite. But it takes a lot of time and effort to prepare for distribution. So it is a little bit problem now. And also other sales are to pizzeria, bakery, and stove and individual stove users. Okay. Next, we introduce activities to about the food. We invite urban owners to grow rice and sake rice. One is a tambo club. Tambo club is invite members from urban areas to grow rice on unused farmland. This allows urban residents to experience farming, protect farmland in Kinasa, and helps to enjoy food security too. Another is Sakamai Club. This also uses unused farmland to grow rice, which is used to make, which is used to make Japanese sake. While the Tambo Club attract people who want to experience farming and eat the rice they grow, the Sakamai Club attract people who like to drink sake. We want to preserve the culture of sake rice production in Kinasa too. Okay. And in addition, uh, I would like to briefly introduce some other activities to convey the richness of life in Kinasa. One is the restoration of old house, which started last year. We are working on the restoration and renovation of the building in the form of workshops. We complete it. When we complete it, it will serve as a base for people to experience the life of Kinasa. This is a Satoyama kitchen, uh, experience life with fire. A wood fired oven and pizza oven have been installed on the edge of this used junior high school playground, allowing people to experience life with fire. And also, the Onimori Tai is a group of volunteers to maintain community based forest. We provide everything from basic chainsaw training to practical training and is gradually increasing the number of supporters who maintain the Kinasa's community-based forest, Satoyama. We are living off natural resources such as oil, gas, 
and minerals created by the Earth for billions of years. This has resulted in climate change. Of course, there are more complex factors involved, but at Mamete Kinasa, we are not to say it loud about environment issues or fighting climate change, but we are working to inherit the beautiful Kinasa landscape, lifestyle, and culture that we love so much. And in order to pass Kinasa, which is blessed with rich nature to the next generation, we aim to reduce the burden on the environment, enjoy the comforts of mountain life, and make Kinasa um, a vibrant, vibrant place, mamete place for both people and community. As a result, this will create a regional cycle and became, become a mitigation and adaptation measure against climate change, I believe. Thank you so much. This is, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariko-san. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I? That is a great, ah, you, now you, yeah, yes, now you can stop your screen sharing. And that is a great example to show sustainable lifestyle in Kinasa and utilizing local wood and other resources. It looks very fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next speaker is Anna Fabiola, head of the degree program in smart and sustainable design at Heme University of Applied Science from Finland. Anna is a design and sustainability ex expert and educator. She has over 15 years experience from the international fashion and design industry, working with both global industry leading companies and sustainability for learners. The title is Sustainable Fashion, The New Normal. Hello. My name is Anna Huaviera. I come from Hame University of Applied Sciences, and I'm going to talk about sustainable fashion today. First, I would like to introduce myself. So my background is in fashion. I worked for uh, many years as a fashion designer in the international fashion industry and uh, seen everything from the industry leaders to the sustainability pioneers. And I currently worked as a head of degree program in smart and sustainable design in Hame University of Applied Sciences. And our students can uh, study fashion, footwear design, glass and ceramics design during the four-year degree program in Bachelor of Cultural and Arts. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that design can drive the change for a better future. So now let's dig deeper into the topic of sustainable fashion. Sustainability is often uh, approached with the three pillars of sustainability planet, people, and profit. And within the sustainable fashion framework, the environmental element, the social element, and the economic element are present as well. But in addition to this, uh, within the fashion framework, also we need to see the cultural sustainability element and the aesthetic sustainability element. Within the sustainable fashion framework, the element of environmental, the planet means a cleaner production, uh, less waste and less impact on the nature. The people dimension includes the social responsibility, working conditions, human rights questions, but also questions about the product safety and satisfaction. 
The profit element includes the new business models that uh, are more circular and uh, require less manufacturing, so producing less impact. Uh, the cultural element in the sustainable fashion dimensions includes the cultural systems and value systems, uh, people's behaviors towards, for example, consumptions and uh, different cultural elements and ideas as well. The aesthetic, the aesthetic element includes the design attributes of the product, for example, timelessness, uh, durability and continuous attraction to an object. So why does sustainable design matter? It's estimated that over 80% of all product-related environmental impacts are determined during the design phase of the product. And a traditional view of the fashion industry uh, uh, puts it into four different levels where all of these design decisions are affecting. For example, the primary level consists of raw materials. For example, the farms where either animals or plants are grown to produce fibers that make into the fabrics that are used in the manufacturing level. The manufacturing secondary level of fashion industry includes the designers, the wholesalers and factories who produce the clothing, which is then sold at the retail level, which is the third level of fashion industry. The auxiliary level, the fourth level, uh, is a bit more uh, abstract. It consists of, for example, media, consultants, PR, I would say influencers nowadays, and other support services that are connected to all of the other levels. And at the end of the pipeline is the consumer. And as you can see, the flow of goods and services and uh, energy goes from the raw materials towards the consumer. And there is really not that much take back, uh, which is required. And the decisions that the designers uh, can make to affect, to make the, for example, this pipeline a little bit more sustainable is in material choices, using organic materials or uh, choosing factories, which uh, comply with the labor legislation and human rights and maybe try to educate the consumers about uh, being mindful of how they purchase fashion. But still, uh, even with a little bit better choices, we still end up a lot of resources being wasted. And to meet the planetary boundaries, we need to shift towards circular economies also in the fashion industry. And how do we make this transition from linear to circular fashion? It's an interesting question. The circular fashion ecosystem has all of the same levels and even some additional ones than the linear fashion system. But the difference in, is that uh, at the end, all of the value, the resources, the energy is returned to the uh, process. We are closing the loop from linear to circular to keep the value in rotation in the circle and uh, the design decisions and collaboration is even more important in the circular fashion ecosystem and what are the actions and approaches designers can take in the circular fashion ecosystem to design out the waste so to say uh, designing for lower waste uh, designing for lower impact materials and processes so the negative effects are eliminated uh, designing for longevity to extend the lifespan of the garments and also designing for recyclability, designing for the end of life of the products. So we can ensure that they never actually become waste. Uh, next, I'm going to share some examples from fashion industry, from brands and designers who are already taking these approaches and applying them. Uh, I've tried to find examples that come from the Nordics, from Finland or, or Nordic countries, uh, just to show the local aspect of this as well. So what does it mean to design for lower waste? Uh, one approach is to use a design and pattern making uh, garment construction technique, which is called the zero-phase fashion, which means that uh, 
there is no, for example, cutting waste, no uh, side waste of the process when manufacturing the product. Uh, this example here is from one of our students, Magdalena. And uh, she made this beautiful dress by creating all the shapes into the product from square uh, fabrics by using a smoking technique. So uh, zero fashion garments are not only squares. There's a lot of interesting and creative techniques to, to apply this into interesting and wearable fashion. Uh, so what approaches have designers taken to design the, for lower impact materials and processes? And uh, um, I'm so sorry that the um, some trouble with the audience for especially for the Japanese listeners. So let me let us try to play again. I think next time it will work. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what approaches have designers taken to design the, for lower impact materials and processes? And uh, this is something, an area that there is a lot of interesting development happening currently. So interesting and really important is that the designers and also maybe consumers should understand uh, different fibers and where they originate and what are their life cycles and take that into consideration already in the design process. Uh, favor may be renewable, recyclable and bio-based materials. Uh, also avoid unnecessary treatments and transportation. So producing locally and based on demand, not producing uh, a lot of garments to warehouses. And an interesting company from Sweden is Studio Heine, who produces the garments they do locally. And uh, it's interesting because the products are customized based on customers' own measurements, and each garment is made on demand. So after a client uh, chooses a product with her own measurements, it's produced for her. So there is no overproduction at all. Uh, Globe Hope is one of the sustainability pioneers in the world and also in Finland, and they are known for using already existing materials, so applying no new resources. Uh, I think one of their most recognizable uh, products is uh, accessories and bags made from recycled seat belts. Uh, Another interesting Finnish example is pure waste textiles, and they manufacture uh, jersey and cherry fabrics from 100% recycled materials using very little water and energy. And this is achieved by using a pre-consumer uh, textile waste from the surrounding factories they produce in India from the surrounding factories. So harnessing the local uh, textile industries network and using the excess materials from that to produce something new and uh, new fibers and uh, new fabrics that can be used again. Otherwise, this material would be waste. So how can we achieve the longevity of the products through design? And, and this is where, for example, service innovations are a uh, quite interesting approach. Uh, Finnish knitwear brand Arela is uh, offering, for example, garment maintenance and garment repairing services as part of their part of their uh, operations, as well as secondhand services. And with maintenance and repairing and good care of products, they can be used much longer and even adapted if needed. Another interesting approach to designing for longevity is modular fashion. And this is an interesting project from a fashion graduate from Aalto University, Sofia Ilmonen. And the modular uh, clothing means that the clothing can be adapted and transformed into something else, into either something uh, added on, taken off, or to different kinds of sizes. So the products can be assembled differently and adapted to different types of users. 
Uh, designing for recyclability, the final step uh, ensures that the materials and energy and value uh, put into the whole production chain of the product is returned into the circle. And achieving this, uh, the approach of monomateriality is one, one way to do that. Currently, it is a big problem in the fashion industry that the mixed materials garments cannot be uh, recycled effectively into new raw materials because they combine, for example, cotton and polyester in fabric and metal in accessories. So we currently don't have an effective process to handle this. And the idea of monomaterial is that when, when we know that the product is made of one singular material, we know that this can be recycled and we know how to recycle that. And a Norwegian outdoors uh, clothing company, Heli Hansen, has uh, created a monomaterial outdoor jacket uh, collection, which is then in the end 100% recyclable. So, uh, is the sustainable and circular fashion the new normal? Yes, it very much is. There is a lot of uh, happening and a lot of uh, things available already to consumers. And uh, something that we need to understand is that uh, these are a few approaches and there are no simple answers and there are many right answers and trial and error testing new things is I think the way to approach this and uh, even though there are no simple answers and or simple paths that do this uh, it is very interesting and inspiring to to walk this path and find a new questions and, and try to solve the challenges of fashion industry and circular fashion. So uh, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiring presentation, Anna. Especially, I guess especially young generations are interested in the fashion area. And as you mentioned, the design process is an, an important key element to make our society sustainable and circular. So next, I'm going to invite um, speakers from UNE Design from Finland. Um, Mark? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have Mark. Oh, Kohonen and Yuka Okonen. And Mark is an entrepreneur in surgical instrument, laser marketing, uh, mark, ma sorry, ma marking um, business since 2001. And the last three years, he has been involved in developing yoga mat, which is made of birch wood, birch wood and recycled material. The title is Sustainable Use of Natural Resources in Product Design. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Dr. Moko. Hello to everyone. My name is uh, Marko Korhonen. You may address me as uh, Mark. And uh, I and uh, my partner, Jukka Okanen, we have a company called uh, Nun Design. At the first, we would like to say that we are very grateful that we can attend uh, to this show, to this seminar. Um, our company is uh, specialized to uh, produce ecological yoga and working station uh, standing mats. Firstly, uh, we would like to show you uh, our product promotion video and then a short tale of how we uh, come to this. In the, way, in the video, there are two stories going on side by side. Log journey uh, from the forest all the way uh, to the end uh, product, and a little bit of yoga, of course. From the internet, we realized that uh, many yoga uh, videos and pictures are mainly uh, done uh, in the sunlight or uh, at the beautiful beach area. So we decided to flip ours upside down, meaning in really uh, deep darkness and really cold area. And now, if you kindly can uh, turn on the video, do you have the access there? Hello. 
my name is Luonto on aina ollut erittäin tärkeässä roolissa meille suomalaisille. Se on antanut meille ruokaa pöytään, puuta rakentaa ja lämmittää kotimme ja saunamme. Puu on upea ja uusiutuva luonnon materiaali. Se on yhtä aikaa pehmeä, kova ja joustava. Yhdistämällä vanhaa tekniikkaa ja uutta teknologiaa, Onnistumme luomaan erittäin kauniin ja todella uniikin sekä yhden maailman ekologisimmista joogamatoista. Se on koivu viilua ja huopaa. Voit nähdä ja tuntea luonnon joogatessasi ja se kulkee aina mukanasi. Vihdoinkin pitkän tuotekehitysjakson jälkeen voimme ylpeänä sanoa. Be the one is born. Be the one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the day when we shoot this video, the outdoor temperature was minus 10, and in the sauna it was uh, plus 85 nicely warm. So it felt great to come outside and do yoga. It didn't feel cold at all. And uh, as you saw in the end of the uh, video, yoga mats are on the ice in the circle. And uh, that view gave us actually an idea to our Be The One logo. And I will continue now. I share the, my screen a little bit. I think this will be seen now, correct? Yes. Okay. Sustainable use of natural resources in product design. That is a very important headline. But uh, what does it mean in our company? We've been thinking about that and uh, Actually, it means planning, designing, and uh, creating products by respecting nature. But it also um, means something else. Here is a nice picture of the yoga. It means that uh, be the one who takes care of yourself. Yoga is known to improve one's well-being bringing harmony to mind and uh, body. And we also know that, uh, and we have noticed that uh, standing long hours at the work without using standing mat can do harm and cause pain to the lower part of your body. Standing without shoes or barefoot on the natural material helps eliminate the stress on the on the feet, as well as improving the blood circulation. It also mean, means um, be the one who takes care of the nature. Our yoga mat and standing mats are made from birch wood and recycled felt. Combining these two materials, we really dare say that um, probably Our products are the most ecological in the world, of course, in this category. And if we think about our um, designer, who is our designer? Without doubt, Mother Nature, of course. We leave the design work to her due to the annual rings of the wood. So each mat produced is unique, totally unique. 
And uh, uh, for your information, um, it's not so easy um, to find a suitable perch tree because uh, only 2% of A-grade trees are accepted for the manufacturing process. And that is uh, very little. The very thin layer of the perch is only 0.15 millimeter thick. Um, let's say it's much, uh, uh, much thinner than a, a copy of the, uh, I mean, a copy paper, what you use in the office. This also means that uh, each tree must be chosen in the forest um, and lodged by hand. No big forest machines or so can be used because they could damage or injure the lock. All our wood raw materials have internationally approved PEFC and FSC certificates. Very important issue also. It also means that uh, be the one who takes care of future. One manufactured yoga or standing mat means one tree to be planted. So it is one to one. This is done in cooperation with the Inno Schoolnet Association. While one log gives us material for over 100 yoga mats, therefore we believe we will give back to the nature more than we take. For example, one log equals 100 yoga mats. This means 100 plantings. Throughout the years in our Finnish culture, we have often hesitated to be proud of what we have achieved. But now I must tell you, we can proudly be happy of our product. And uh, we hope that our cooperation with Eno Schoolnet can be as an example for many, many other companies. This is one way we all can make a positive part of changes for the future. Thank you for your attention. Arigato. Mark, thank you so much for your great presentation. Arigato, Kitos. And <laughs> yeah, and taking care of not only nature but also ourselves. And future is very important thing. Important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Kitos. So let's move on to students' presentations. We have the first presentation presenter is Minami Morozumi from Toka University so a high school student so a high school hi Minami hi so the title is lifestyle utilizing local resources so if uh, you can start when you are ready okay Can you see that? Hello, everyone. My name is Minami Morozumi from Tokai Suasuni High School. Thank you for inviting me to the Carbon Conference 2023. Today, I will be, I will be presenting on three topics that utilize local resource in Chino City. First is bioethanol from exotic plants. Second, research on cultured meat using amazake. And finally, I'm going to tell you about our science club activities. Recently, non-native plants and animals are becoming one of the big problems of our ecosystem in Japan. Chino City is no exception. This photo shows Kamikawa River near my school. You can see lots of non-native plants. They are destroying native plants and our ecosystem. Therefore, I suppose that I could make bioethanol 
from this non-native plant. Plant cell walls contain cell walls. This is broken down into glucose by the enzyme cellulose. Next, it is fermented with dry yeast to produce alcohol. But the problem was that this cellulose is very expensive. Then I came up with the idea that I could make use of the deer that are being exterminated in a region. Deer are also one of the big problem because the number is increasing. Deer eat undigested plants, so they have microorganisms that break down cellulose in their digestive tracts. I focus on this microorganism. First, deer's first, second, third, and fourth stomachs and small and large institutes are mashed. Next, dry yeast was added and allowed to ferment. I could make bioethanol. The fourth stomach and small institutes, especially were more effective than cellulose. In this way, bioethanol could be produced from local waste. The second topic is research on cultured meat using amazake. Amazake is one of the Japanese traditional drinks, which is made by fermenting rice with coach mold. It is known to contain many nutrients. Also, it is said that some doctors recommend it to pregnant women because of its high in nutrition. The meat we eat is a mass of muscle cells. Then I thought that if I gave amazake to muscle cells, the number of muscle cells would increase, which would be useful for research on cultured meat. I conducted this experiment with the cooperation of Professor Tomohide Takaya at Shinshu University. The pictures above are micrographs taken on day six and eight. In the medium with amazake, you can see many long Maya tubes and they are curved. The photos below show the cell nuclear illuminated. The blue is a myocyte nucleus and the green is a myocyte that has coalesced into a Maya tube. I found that amazake promotes myoplast division and differentiation into myotubes. Amazake contains a lot of folic acid. Some studies have reported that a deficiency in folic acid in a fetus can lead to stunted growth. I suppose that this result may also be due to the effect of folic acid in amazake. Finally, I would like to introduce some activities in our community. We, the science club, have been conducting demonstrations of green curtains and making eco information reports and distributing them to the citizens of China. We also hold events for children about energy and environmental conservation and work with the local community to protect near endangered butterflies. I think that the most important way to achieve the goal of their carbon is to change children's lifestyles. This is because in 2015, these children will become adults and support our society. To make our boys heard to politicians, we made recommendations to the Chino City Council. It's important that the lifestyles of all citizens change to achieve the goal of zero carbon. Our activities are still small, but we should cherish these small steps. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Minami. Um, your experience experiments using local in ingredients are very interesting. Um, also, it's impressive that you are involved in education and you go out and talk with the city hall and the city council. So next presenter is Maho Todoroki from Yashiro High School. Hello, can you Hi. hear me? Yes, I can hear oh. you. Thanks. Are you ready to okay. start your presentation? Okay, so the title is this CO2 Home Garden. Garden. So go ahead. Hello everyone. I am Maho Todoroki. I'm in the second grade of Yashiro High School. In my research, I aim to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by using bacteria to reduce chemical ammonia. Like some Japanese families, I often made kitchen garden with my family and used phosphorus chemical ammonia. However, through extra calculated learning, I learned one big problem about this manual. Now, chemical phosphorus manual is necessary in agriculture. At the same time, a large amount of carbon dioxide is emitted when drilling and processing resources. Also, Japan relies on imports for almost all phosphorus resources. Through this process, nine kilograms of carbon di dioxide is emitted per 10 kilograms of manu. Thus, phosphorus chemical manu. Ah, sumimasen, <laughs> sumimasen. Next, please. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I, oh, okay. Now, chemical phosphorus manual is necessary in agriculture. At the same time, a large amount of carbon dioxide is emitted when drilling and processing resources. Also, Japan relies on imports for almost all phosphorus resources. Through this process, nine kilograms of carbon dioxide is emitted per 10 kilograms of manual. Thus, Phosphorus chemical manual emits a lot of carbon dioxide. So I decided to look for sustainable manual to replace phosphorus chemical one. And I finally found certain fungus in a paper about manual. Next, please. There are some fungus live with some plants and give them phosphorus in the soil instead of the nutrition that plants made. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus, in short, alien fungus, is one of them. The main merit of using this fungus are providing water and nutrition to host plant, and many kinds of plants can't be, can be its host plant. After you grow the plant, alien fungus increases and improves growth of its next host plant. Next, please. Its major host plants in home garden is sunflower and soybean. As I said before, alien fungus has many merits, but it also has one demerit. Its manure is so expensive that you can buy it a lot. Next, please. But I thought this problem can be covered by one characteristic of alien fungus. In other words, after growing host plant, it increases and helps next host plant to grow. By using this cycle, you can reduce money consumption and save money. Next, please. Then I made experiments whether my theory was correct. First, I grew two kinds of host plants and radish. Radish is not host plant. They are grown with alien fungus and without after growing uh, and without it. After growing enough, I compare them on these points. Second, I grew ice plant in this four soil. The normal one is for the control experiment. These four also grow both with alien fungus and without it. After growing enough, I compare them by diameter. By these two experiments, I reproduce the cycle which I talked earlier. Next, please. 
This is the result of the first experiment. The top of the ranking of AM fungus effect is sunflower, the next is soybean, and the bottom is radish. Next, please. This is the result of the second experiment. Considering the first result, the ranking of growth degree of ice plant uh, should be like that. But, uh, but the fact was different. The ice plant which grew on soybean soil is grew less than I had thought. Maybe it is because all soils except normal one lose nutrition that can't be covered by Indian fungus. Next, please. Based on these results and consideration, I read three conclusions. First, after you grow host plant, Indian fungus increases and improves the growth of its next host plant. It is called from references. However, third, bad rotation steals nutrition in the soil, so you can't rotate plants only by AM fungus manure. It needs other manure. In conclusion, it can help reducing carbon dioxide with home garden, but cannot save money. Next, please. From here, I also made a short hypothesis based on the characteristics of Nagano. In this hypothesis, my hypothesis is using the roots of, next please. My hypothesis is using the roots of cedar and surrounding. Why did I make this idea? I will explain the process to make idea from papers. Next please. For the first, Cedar is one of the host plants of AEM. In the practice forest of Tokushima University, the AEM fungus synthesis rate of cedar in June is 75%. Also, the ratio of its forest area in Nagano is second. But number of its old forest in is increases due to the trend of longer term of cultivation. In the elderly forest, the excess nitrogen, which is as important nutrition as phosphorus, stresses the environment. Based on this information, you can see that the cedar forest contains alien bacteria and nutrition that adversely affect the environment. It will be difficult to put the hard roots of cedar into the soil, but I think this is method can encourage to CO2 home gardening uh, to reduce CO2 home gardening in Nagano. These are references of my research. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Next, please. That is it for me. Thank you all for listening. Naho, thank you so much for your presentation and good job. and. That's amazing that you did such experiments all by yourself outside of the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. So next presenter is Tan Bishop from University of Eastern Finland. Hi. Thank you. Okay, here, I'll let me just share my screen here. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So um so just so just for a little bit of context so i'm currently a master's student at the university of eastern finland in the environmental policy and law program um today's presentation will be about some activism that i did during my bachelor studies uh, where i was um, an environmental studies major with a concentration in animal welfare this will mainly be about some like campus-based activism that i i did surrounding uh, the sample food programs and um, and I'll tie it into my her master's thesis a, a little later. And so, um, okay. Uh, so this initiative that I'll be focusing on today is basically a meatless Monday, which is an initiative to either have a meatless cafeteria menu on campus every Monday or to highlight plant-based options. And the meatless Monday is something that a lot of schools, hospitals, et cetera, participate in. Actually, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I, I'm in a grant proposal for like 
health facilities too. So it's a, but, but this campaign here though, was based on Lewis and Clark College, in Portland, Oregon, where I got my bachelor's. And initially what it involved in, what it involved was placing a sign next to the vegan food section in the cafeteria. And the sign discussed animal welfare and environmental benefits of plant-based eating. For example, it talked about things like carbon uh, emissions because the estimates vary quite a bit, but uh, but the animal agriculture does a, a pretty big percentage of um, global greenhouse gas emissions. Estimates range from 14.5 to 87%, and like 18 to 51% are popular estimates. But uh, lately, I'd say the estimates have been going up. And then it also talked about things like land use, water use, biodiversity, and then and also the tens of billions of animals uh, on the on factory farms themselves. And, uh, okay, now there are a, a number of groups involved in this. I won't talk about them too much just to save time, but uh, the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition and the Humane League are both nonprofits that are dedicated to farmed animal welfare campaigns and um, and intersectional uh, plant-based uh, activism, and then Animal Collective, Students Engaged in Eco Defense, and Lewis and Clark Animal Defense Fund are all like animal protection and environmental groups that do uh, both campus-based activism and uh, um, and community activism that are based at the college. Um, now, uh, a few challenges that we would sometimes face in doing our activism. So, one of them is sort of making sure to be inclusive of people who have allergies or other dietary needs because well, one thing that we would sometimes face would be people who had uh, complex allergies or they have uh, allergies to more than one thing for example both to soy and nuts and so uh, so just uh, looking at ways that we can have uh, a, a wider variety of options like lentils and coconut based products for example another one is sometimes a lack of community education on for example uh, plant-based protein because especially at the college we had a lot of students who were athletes who had concerns about getting enough protein and so sometimes what we would uh, that we would run into something like that and where either they would either overestimate how much protein we need or they would or just uh, uh, or, 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 or just maybe that there wouldn't be as much awareness of the options so sometimes education outreach could be useful and then Sometimes there were logistics in the cafeteria itself, like there were food stations that already had labels that said, for example, chicken or tofu. And then, so it could be difficult to label to, to see which, what the Green Monday special, so to speak, to, that was only the tofu. So that, that could be a bit difficult. So that's why we initially only had a, had the sign next to one station. And also just finding someone who could take up and down the sign could be a bit of a challenge because sometimes they wanted a student to do it, sometimes a cafeteria employee. So. Uh, and so, but now moving forward, though, so, so this is, uh, see, these are uh, a few things that I've looked at in, in my master's thesis. And um, and so one of them is just sort of where to focus our activism a little more specifically, because because on the one hand, when we are making the biggest difference for in terms of animal welfare, it's, uh, it's often more helpful to focus on re reducing fish and chicken consumption because it's been found that if one person does that, they can spare 1,500 and 1,220 days of suffering uh, as they quantified it. This is a study done by the Humane League, and it's uh, and that and those are the highest numbers of days of suffering out of any out of any product that we could uh, that we could reduce. And then on the other hand, if we reduce beef and other uh, red meat, uh, that can be the most helpful when it comes to reducing carbon emissions and and a lot of other environmental impacts. But I mean, but, but both, I mean, I mean, all, all types help for both animal welfare and environmental causes, as long as we don't just replace one animal product with another. And then uh, another thing is that sometimes pictures next to food products can give false impressions of animal welfare or environmental impacts. For example, if you see, say, a cow on a field, it might look like, okay, they're on a pasture raising sustainable, but then um, that's sadly not the reality most of the time. And so having signs next to the plant-based products could, that was sort of a way of potentially counteracting that. And then the, the language landscape has also changed a bit because for example, the word vegan used to be considered very radical and something that we would stay away from a bit, but then more recently it's been shown to be more effective in 
inspiring people. And then it can also go the other way because consumers, when consuming more of these plant based alternatives, can then um, some, sometimes uh, give higher regard to animal welfare and environmental benefits. And, and it, inter and it intersects with some of the other issues, whether it's pandemics or workers' rights and, uh, and more. So, anyway, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Talon. Great, great presentation and your perspective. I mean, the dining and also animal welfare is very important. Thank you. Thank you. So next presenter is Sol Kishino from Shinshu University. Hi. Hello. Hi, are you ready to start? Okay. Okay, so. Wait a minute. Oh, can I see my screen? Okay. Uh, I'll start. Hello, my name is Okishino, a student at Shinshu University. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation today. The purpose of my presentation today is to talk about my effort to create green community. The green community I am aiming for is a society. Mm. Uh, we are nature and people coexist and green resources circulate in rural area. Today, I will talk, I'd like to talk about why I'm trying to achieve this kind of community and what I'm doing to realize my ideal society. First, I talk about why, uh, and we talk about the two reasons. The first reason is a feeling for my hometown. Uh, this picture shows the elementary school I attended. I used to play every day on the bus ground. However, this wonderful school was closed down nine years ago due to population decline. My hometown, uh, Marubashira Village, Yasti, Mia Prefecture, is famous for eager pottery, but it is in decline. Today, there are probably more deer and wild boars than bridges. As my hometown has nothing expected for mountains, I did not, I did not like my, ho my hometown and decided to come to Nagano. The second reason is chance in Nagano. At the university, I was exposed to the rich natural environment of Nagano Prefecture and this this uh, de discovered the value of the nature. I learned that our lack of use of the resources of the mountains and forests has not only led to the depopulation of the rural area, but also the destruction of the ecosystem. I have come to believe that there is more potential in rural area. In Japan, there are unmanaged forests and abundant farmland. By utilizing these resources, we can create new local industries and local production for local consumption. But how can we increase the use of the local resources? To consider this question, I participated in Green Innovator Academy, a program for students and adults to learn about the decarbonized society. I talked with people who are working to realize decarbonized society in various industries and participate in field work in Fukushima. What I learned there was that in terms of achieving stable energy supply, using local resources on a small scale is expensive and difficult. But it was tackling because it's difficult. Now I am currently involved in two activities to promote local resource use. The first is internship at the Rovay Japan, uh, which I started August last year. I am involved in the Rovay's policies in Obose town and prefecture, which aims to create resource recycling town. We uh, provided environmental education to children in the town and held compost production workshop. We also make charcoal to we also make charcoal uh, to make effective use of the organic waste. Obose is famous for 
its fruit trees and chestnuts. And there are many orchards, which produce many pruned plants. By turning them into charcoal, and we, are we are trying to promote their use as a fuel and soil conditioners. The second activity is Sinshu Dai's project, an initiative to compost food waste discharged from university cafeterias. The compost we make is made of wood and soil, and bacteria decompose food waste. This compost is made from mocha wood, and a wood from nagano that is processed to prevent it from rotting. The goal is to create a circle in which the finished compost is used in the field. Uh, these are what I have done and I am doing right now. Uh, this is my ideal society. I am working on the use of the biomass in Obuse, and at Sins University project, I am working on composting. Each one is a very small step to get me closer to my goal. My goal is to create a community where people can be proud of where they grow up by connecting people with nature and promoting the use of the resources close at hand. I don't want to see the people like me saying there are only mountains in the village where I was born. In closing, I'd like to share a phrase I keep in my mind. We can see the future, but we can create it. What kind of zero carbon world do you want to realize? I believe each step or small action we take will lead to the green society we are aiming for. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for your presentation. So um, I was moved by your various various kind of actions and me me message. Thank you. Thank you. And um, sorry for going over the time, but we like to continue uh, our sessions. So the last presenter is Muhammadu Hogali, um, University of Instant Finland Business School. Could you turn on your video, please? Muhammad, are you here? Yeah, hello, yes. Yeah. Great, let me open my camera. Okay. okay. Now we spotlight you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. <laughs> so no, now, it's okay. <laughs> now you can start your presentation. Okay, great. So I'm sharing my screen. <sighs> okay, great. First of all, it's a pleasure to present in the Zero Carbon Conference. Um, I would like to uh, provide a high-level overview about my research, which is focusing on mindful consumption through transformative virtual experiences. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Eastern Finland. I'm part of uh, UF Business School, focusing on sustainable consumption in tourism. And when you look at tourism, it's actually a sector that employs... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry to interrupt uh, your presentation. Uh, we can see the your slide next slide too so could you i think it's the presentation presentation board we can see your uh, main slide uh, and also next slide too. okay let me uh, yeah hide presenter mode so this way is good i'm not sure how to go yeah. for the screen yeah. um, Ah, because I have two screen. Sorry. Okay. Um, just a second.
All right, let's try again. Okay, I hope it is better now without the... We, we still can see your next slide. Uh, you can go to the display settings at the top. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm familiar with this. I don't know what's the issue. You mean like, because I'm still in the first slide, but duplicate slideshow? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, okay. uh, go to the swap, swap presenter view and slideshow. Yes, yes now we okay. can see just the slideshow. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, great. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Yeah, so um, um, as I mentioned, um, I'm part of the tourism sector and specifically part of the research community here in Finland as uh, a student at the University of Eastern Finland. And when we look at tourism, it's actually a sector that employs 10% of the population and is also contributing to the 10% of the global GDP. And in addition to many other uh, key figures that you can see in, 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 in the first slide. But unfortunately, it's also a sector that is um, uh, responsible for um, a lot when it comes to uh, uh, the carbon footprint and also ecological as well as waste. Um, and as we know, uh, the global carbon emission uh, is expected to increase by almost uh, 50% in the future. Uh, so tourism actually, uh, because of uh, its uh, linkage to transportation, as we can see in the figure down, as well as lodging and other services, uh, it's responsible for almost 8% of the global carbon emission. And when we look at any tourist, um, their, their footprint when they travel is considerably higher than their own footprint at home, but also considerably higher than a resident footprint. And it was estimated that tourists generate double the amount of waste compared to local residents. There are, of course, many solutions uh, that are implemented, uh, such as uh, low or passive energy systems, biomass and ener uh, renewable energy um, uh, innovations, circular economy, uh, in addition to increasing the public or over private transportation ratio and, and using durable and green technologies across the tourism and hospitality sector. But one thing that have not been looked at is actually um, the consumer mindset. Uh, we can have all of this legislation and, 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 and technologies, but the consumer will make the decision eventually of uh, which type of activities they want to or like which type of product they would like to 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 pursue during their travel um, initiatives, and this is something that has not been looked at, and it's very important for sustainable development, which require further uh, exploration. Which was an inspiration for my research, and actually, um, my research is focusing on on the concept of um, mindful consumption. So when we look at consumption itself. Um, uh, and specifically this mindful consumption, it's under the umbrella of sustainable consumption. And it implies that consumer would make uh, choices while considering environmental, social, economic, and ethical requirements. And it stems from, from the fact that consumption has two uh, uh, facets. The first one is what we see, basically the consumer behavior in terms of engagement of the consumption. And the second one, which is intangible, the mindset of the consumer. Um, when it comes to their altitude, values, or also expectation. And it has been shown that actually the mindset guides and drives the behavior. In other words, if you want to change um, consumption behavior, we have to change the mindsets. And that's why my research is really going deep into the root of, of the consumer mindset. And, and if you can see in the figure here, um, this has three components, you know, the care for self, the care for the community, and also the care for nature which yields a concept called a uh, mindful mindset. Um, we've looked at a theory that is linked to this uh, concept, which is the mindset theory. It starts actually in, in education, and it highlights that um, people have two orientations. They can either have a fixed mindset or what we call entity theory, where they believe that their intelligence, abilities, and, and, and flexibility to change is, 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 is not possible. And we have other people who have a growth mindset where basically they are believing that their intelligence, their abilities are actually unsealed. Uh, of course, it's not um, a zero to one, uh, uh, like zero or one um, value. It's basically a continuum depending on the activity. 
and 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 this entity incremental dimension or like um, continuum um, uh, implies that people will fall across uh, you know uh, the line between a fixed and a growth mindset. And it has been shown that actually this has can change uh, by by designing experiences. So constantly, so this is constantly evolving with experience. Um, so the objective actually of my research is basically to evaluate the concept of mindful consumption as actually a sustainable tourism solution, uh, not only in the tourism sector but also across all all other sectors. And also would like to imply um, uh, transformative experiences in, in virtual reality. And, and the reason we are looking into virtual reality is because it has the highest potential to um, enhance and foster transformative experiences. And we can see in this figure, basically, um, the, the change uh, from, from, from a fixed to a growth mindset is actually had these three components, the affective engagement, um, the behavioral engagement, and also the cognitive engagement. And by designing these experiences um, in the near future, we are plan we are hoping that we can actually um, contribute to that. So, in summary, um, what we are looking at is basically to see if 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 indeed um, when we design these um, transformative virtual experiences, we can actually uh, drive more people to have uh, or or to adopt a growth mindset, which can hopefully in turn lead to mindful and sustainable consumption. So that's it from my side. Um, thank you so much for listening. And I would be happy to reply to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Muhammad. Al. Thank you for your presentation. And that's a very important topic considering the impact of tourism and mindful consumption as a sustainable tourism solution. So I'm looking forward to what you will find out through your research. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to invite commentator Maria Korostom, project coordinator at University of Eastern Finland to wrap up this today's session. Hi, Maria. Thank Hi, and thank you. And also yeah. I would like to invite all presenters here. So could you turn on, to turn on your video? And please join us. Yes. So thank now you. <laughs> now we can see your oh, faces. Okay. Together. May I start with my yes. wrap up? Okay. Yep. Uh, you asked me to be a quick because we are already over time. So I don't mention all the presenters by name, but I like to really thank you all because you all had a very interesting presentations today and they have a very nice aspects to the day's um, team mitigation of climate change or uh, emissions of carbon. And uh, like uh, we started in the beginning already, we heard that, uh, okay, it's really time to make uh, actions now because we already see the impact of the climate change in our nature and our environment. And this is a task of all for all generations. And uh, um, because we like to live uh, close to nature or uh, have a contact with the nature all the time, it's it's a very important. We understand how how the climate change uh, have an effect on on the nature uh, um, different processes. And um, we heard very nice um, examples how we can. Uh, behave in our environment or uh, behave as a, a consumer so we can have actions in our, in our own environment, how we utilize energy and with what kind of energy we're utilizing and um, uh, maybe we can uh, have a better insulation so that we don't lo lost any, any energy in that way. Um, Increasing awareness of the how to mitigate uh, the, uh, climate change is also very important. And um, there were some nice examples from uh, Japan, how in different uh, valleys or villages there are a lot of uh, nice actions uh, how to uh, decrease emissions of carbon, for example. And uh, like in energy issues, there were different forums where they have already actions 
to um, be more efficient or even self-sufficient uh, with the energy issues or the uh, food uh, production or uh, how to prepare the food or which kind of raw materials for food. So these are uh, choices in, in our everyday life. So I think that uh, even the um, challenges are global, but really we can or by ourselves do something for the to find uh, solutions. And um, yeah, there also was nice aspects about the fashion or, or pra designing products. So it's important when we are uh, choosing our uh, what we are going to wear, what we are going to use. It's really important to think about that uh, how the product has been uh, made from which kind of raw material, how the uh, designers have taken care that it, it's uh, sustainable and uh, it could be a, a very a different aspects. So they all are very important. And um, even our lifestyle can be uh, using more local resources and in being sustainable in that way. And uh, I noticed there were uh, high school students. I hope they will in, uh, educate themselves to be a researcher because they were really nice uh, initiatives using a uh, nice uh, researching way to study things. So there was uh, uh, about the energy production and uh, uh, producing food. And uh, uh, especially I like that um, aspect of uh, uh, growing food with the AM fungi, fungus. So the, I think the world of fungus is very, not already well, well known, so that it's really important to have the research and that research on that area. And uh, there are also really uh, concrete uh, actions like the Meatless Monday, and uh, ideas how to change behavior of the uh, consumers. And uh, it's very really nice to see that the motivation for the different kind of actions came from, from the own, own environmental. So the, how to composting uh, bio waste or, or uh, how to think about the, how we behave as the tourists, for example, so that the, and I like that uh, idea there was in fun presentation that we can really create the future. We don't have to wait what will happen. We, we are able to create the future. So that was my brief uh, wrap up uh, from, the, from this, uh, today's presentations. And I really thank all the presenters. Very interesting presentation again. Thank you. Thank you, Kitos Maria, to wrap up this uh, today's session. And they, as we put on Zoom chat, the presentations with English subtitle will be available in, in a YouTube playlist, and also Japanese version will be updated uploaded to Japan Japanese website. And also, we would like to keep our conversation and make our connection stronger even after the conference. So we set the dates for our next meetup on March 22nd and April 21st, um, one day before us day. So it will be wonderful if we, we can plan next actions together for us day. And we would like to hear what kind of activities and we can do together beyond the countries and you can put your ideas on another public um, until the, the next meetup. I think you can see the public link in Zoom chat. Yes, so, okay, now uh, we are going to finish this today's session. We will have day two at the same time. It's about adaptation, sustainable local businesses. Well, we keep this Room um, Zoom open after the live streaming stops, so we can you can stay if you want to like to uh, talk with presenters. And I think Kaya is raising your hands. 
Yes, let's not forget about the picture. So if all the presenters could switch on their cameras so we can take a screenshot. Yes. What do, what do we say? Muikku in Finnish. Muik. Muikku. Muik. So say muik. Muikku. Muik. <laughs> did you take pictures? I did. I hope that they okay. are okay. They should okay. be fine. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming today. And sorry that oh, it's over the time. So see you tomorrow. Thank you. Kitos. Arigatou.